Welcome to The Analytic Christian. I'm Jordan, and this is the channel that helps you explore Christian philosophy and theology. Today, we're going to be talking about panpsychism. What is that? You might have heard of it before. We're going to explain what it is and how it relates to theism. So my guest is Dr. Thomas Bogardus, a professor of philosophy at Pepperdine University. And I've had him on a couple of times previously to discuss evolutionary debunking arguments, substance dualism, arguments from consciousness. So lots of good stuff coming from him. I'd encourage you to go check out those videos as well after you watch this one. Let's jump in. Uh, so I reached out to you and because I saw an interview that Cameron Bertuzzi did with Philip Goff on his channel. And oh. Philip defends panpsychism. So I was like, you know what? I'd like to hear Thomas's take on this since my understanding is you got your graduate degree in philosophy of mind, right? I wrote a dissertation in the philosophy of mind. And yeah, that was sort of my area of specialization. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, jump in. I'll go ahead and share the screen. And I guess first question is just what is panpsychism? Yeah. Um, so I thought we could start by um, giving a little recap of the sort of positions in the philosophy of mind and the debate. So I think most people are familiar with the concept of physicalism. So on physicalism, we just have these little itty bitty bits of matter, this physical stuff, maybe fields and so on, um, the sorts of things that physicists study. Um, but it's just typically thought of as a world in which there's just atoms and the void, as Democritus put it, just little itty bitty things in the space between them. That's what the world consists of, according to physicalism. And I put a little picture here that I made in a PowerPoint, just imagining some electrons, you know, floating through space. Of course, um, that vastly oversimplifies things. There are lots of other kinds of elementary particles. Um, hmm, I'm trying to advance the slide here. There we go. Um, so we've got some fermions and some bosons and some antimatter as well. So I'm just going to simplify that and draw these as little... Uh, the elementary particles, just as little blue circles with an E in there to yeah. signify electrons or whatever, just little physical bits, um, little bits of physical stuff. All right, so that's um, physicalism. And But the question for physicalism, a, a sort of nagging question has always been, how do we fit consciousness into this picture? Um, how do we make space for um, a mind in the physical world? So I put a little lightning bolt up there to represent, like we've got conscious minds that we need to account for. So the question for physicalism is how do we account for these things? Um, yeah, so how do we fit mind into the physical world? And we've gotten a bunch of answers from physicalists and the relations that they kind of explore between the physical stuff and our minds are typically things like grounding or constitution or realization or just identity um, these are the sorts of things, these are the sorts of relationships that physicalists propose um, when you ask them, what's the relationship between physical stuff and minds? So here on the slide, I just pictured it as like, somehow we're going to try to fit the mind into the physical world. Um, but that's difficult to do. And it's unclear what the relation is going to be. So that's why I put these question marks here. Dualism, on the other hand, says, um, look, we're not going to try to identify the mind with physical stuff. Physical stuff surely exists, um, but the mind is not reducible to physical stuff. Um, the mind is irreducibly non-physical. Our conscious minds can't be reduced that way. And, you know, a lot of people complain that, oh, well, that sort of makes this sharp division between these two kinds of things. So I represented that with a little line in between conscious minds and physical stuff. And um, the complaint typically is, how could conscious minds um, cause things to happen in the physical world if they're a totally different kind of thing? Or maybe a better way to put it is, when does that happen? <laughs> um, isn't the universe just sort of composed of physical causes producing physical effects? Um, when would minds break into that causal order and change the direction, change the trajectory of reality? Okay, um, so probably your listeners are familiar with physicalism and dualism. Um, so we're going to talk about panpsychism today. And I, I guess I should say up front that this is going to be a sort of opinionated introduction of panpsychism. I'm not a panpsychist um, and I'm not, a, I'm not really a big fan of panpsychism, um, <laughs> but mostly just because I can't really see how it helps. Um, 
trying to stay open-minded on it. And if, if um, anyone can let me know how it would help, um, I'd be grateful to hear it, but I'll try to explain why I think hand psychism doesn't help, um, doesn't help us make any sort of progress on this mind body problem on the question of how consciousness relates to the physical world. So in a nutshell, here's what pan psychists say. Um, they say, uh, well, look, the physicalists were right and that it's just little itty bitty things that compose reality. But um, what we're gonna do is pan psychists is say, these aren't um, insensate uh, physical things. Physical things are not merely physical. They're experiential in some way. Consciousness is like down there at the very bottom level of reality. These little itty bitty things themselves have a kind of consciousness or at least a sort of proto consciousness. And then the thought is maybe that will help us somehow explain how um, the mind fits into the physical world. But as we'll see, that's still sort of an open question. Like what do we say about our conscious minds? What's the relationship between them and um, the little itty bitty components of reality that have now been electrified, as it were, that are now conscious, that are now experiential. Okay, um, so here's a statement of what panpsychism is from Philip Goff. He said, on a standard form of the view, the basic constituents of the physical world, perhaps electrons and quarks, have incredibly basic forms of conscious experience. And the consciousness of human or animal, of a human or animal brain, is derived from the consciousness of its most basic parts. Okay, so that's the difference. Um, unlike the physicalists, the panpsychists are not saying that the little bits of reality are merely physical, non-experiential. Panpsychists say the little bits of reality are themselves somehow experiential. They have, according to Goff, incredibly basic forms of conscious experience. But then again, the question arises, like, what do we say about our minds? How do our minds relate to these little itty, itty bitty conscious things? And here we just get the statement that somehow um, our conscious minds are derived from the consciousness of the basic parts. Okay, here's another statement of um, what Philip Goff thinks is the typical panpsychist view. It's called monistic panpsychism. So as a panpsychist, you could say um, electrons and... Um, uh, electrons and the other sorts of fermions and bosons, in addition to physical properties like charge and mass and so on, these things also have experiential properties. That's one way you could go. You could be a kind of dualist about the um, elementary particles. Or you could be a monist and say, actually, these um, what we were calling physical properties like mass and charge, they are themselves experiential. And Philip Goff thinks that's the way panpsychists typically go. So here's a statement of the view. All physical science really tells us, um, it doesn't tell us anything of the underlying categorical nature of physical properties, like mass and charge. Physical science doesn't tell us the nature of the properties conceived independently of the behavioral dispositions that they ground. So the, mon the monistic panpsychist holds that physical properties are in their categorical nature, forms of consciousness. Mass, for example, is a form of consciousness that physics characterizes in terms of its behavior. Um, so if, for example, you asked a physicist, what is charge or something like that? Um, you might get an answer in terms of how charged particles behave. You know, so um, opposite charges attract, like charges repel. But that's just to tell me what things with charges do. It doesn't really tell me what charge is. And so the panpsychist says, maybe <laughs> fundamental physical properties like charge and mass um, and spin and so on. These are just experiential properties. These are forms of consciousness, whatever that means. <laughs> so if you can make sense of that, um, maybe you're a monistic panpsychist, but that's the claim. It reminds me of <clears throat> idealism in a way. I guess I, it's like, what yeah. we would typically attribute as, oh, this stuff's physical. It's like, maybe that's just a form of consciousness. Yeah, it's at least saying um, there are things out there like electrons and quarks and so on. So they really exist. Oh, okay. Um, it's just that they have features or properties that are forms of consciousness. Okay. Properties. Hmm. 
Yeah, so it's not just that only minds exist. You've got these little things um, that people like Galen stress and we'll call physical. They just say like, we have had an impoverished conception of what it is to be physical. Um, so they'll say physical things exist, um, but at least the monistic panpsychist says all the features of these physical things are themselves mental. So I guess you might wonder, like, <laughs> in what in what sense are these physical if all their features are mental? Doesn't that just mean they're they're little mental bits, little mental particles? Um, but anyway, that's that's the view. So I tried to depict it again, again on like boring old physicalism. We just have these merely physical particles out there um, with properties like mass and charge and spin and so on. Um, but those aren't mental properties. Those aren't experiential in any way. And then panpsychism kind of jazzes up our view of the world and says, uh, no, those little itty bits of um, reality are themselves conscious. Um, their features are forms of consciousness. So it's certainly more exciting and it's um, garnered a lot of attention and enthusiasm lately in the literature. Um, but the question is, is there a good reason to believe it's true? So yeah, that's what I was going to ask you next. Like, what are the arguments for this? Yeah, view? Why, why believe it's true? How, how would it help us um, sort of advance the, the philosophical debate about the mind body problem? Well, here's some reasons to think it's true. Um, oh, shoot. Well, first, actually, I wanted to distinguish between two kinds and then we'll look at the arguments, two kinds of panpsychism. Um, so one kind is what Philip Goff calls emergent panpsychism. So on this view, facts about human and animal consciousness are themselves fundamental. So according to Philip Goff, human and animal, animal consciousness, like my feeling of pain, my mind, these things causally arise from consciousness at the fundamental level. So here's a way you can kind of depict that. We've got all these little electrified particles, as it were, these little particles with um, features that are themselves forms of consciousness. So we've got these little um, conscious fundamental particles. But then my pain, my conscious experience, just sort of causally arises from uh, the consciousness of these fundamental bits. So it's not reducible to the consciousness of those fundamental bits. Um, it's irreducibly non-fundamental. <laughs> um, and so that might kind of remind you of dualism. It's It sort of looks like the structure of dualism. We've got the component bits, the bits that I'm made out of, um, the elementary particles that compose my body and my brain. And on panpsychism, those elementary particles are themselves conscious. Um, but then when I ask about my mind and my conscious states, emergent panpsychism says, well, that's something different. That's something in addition. Um, that is not itself, um, or sorry, that is another fundamental fact. It's not reducible to the consciousness of the elementary particles. Okay, so it kind of reminds you of dualism, and that's going to be important later. Um, another view is constitutive panpsychism, constitutive panpsychism. Oh, I think I misspelled that. Facts about human and animal consciousness are not fundamental, but they're grounded in or realized by or constituted by facts about the more fundamental kinds of consciousness. So this will probably remind you of what the physicalist says when it comes to the relationship between um, our minds and uh, the little bits that compose my body and my brain. So um, on this version of panpsychism, it sort of looks like this. This is the way I depicted it. But um, what's being said is we've got the little bits that compose my body and my brain. And on panpsychism, the features of those elementary particles are forms of consciousness. But then when you ask about my pain or my mind, somehow we're going to try to reduce my pain or my conscious experiences to the goings on in those um, elementary particles. And that's kind of what physicalism tries to do. The only difference is physicalism says the mind is reducible to merely physical stuff, stuff that isn't itself experiential. Panpsychism says your mind, my mind, are reducible to um, physical stuff where physical is understood in such a way that the elementary particles themselves have forms of conscious experience. Okay, so those are the two kinds of panpsychism. Um, one sort of looks to resemble the structure of dualism the other one kind of resembles the structure of um, physicalism. 
Um, and just as the physicalists propose all sorts of relationships for the mind and the body, for the mental and the physical, they'll say things like the mental is constituted by the physical or realized by the physical um, or grounded in the physical or just flat out identical to the physical. Something that would allow us to say it's just, you know, nothing over and above the physical. Um, the constitutive panpsychist is saying something similar. Um, they just have a different conception of what it is to be physical. Okay, so now we can look at some arguments for the view. This one's from Galen Strassen. He says, uh, he said in one place, my intuition says there's no way that you can put completely non-experiential things together to cross into this other realm, this realm of conscious experience, this realm of the mental. You can't just take non-experiential things, put them together, arrange them in a certain way, have them interact, interact with each other in a certain way, and boom, out pops an experience. So as a dualist, I think that's right. <laughs> um, but what Galen Strauss and the panpsychist concludes is, all right, so if you can't do that, then some of the experiencing stuff must be down at the bottom, right at the beginning. So some of the experiencing stuff must be down at the bottom, right at the beginning. And that's panpsychism. Yeah, try So basically saying like, you can get experiential things from other experiential things. Yeah. That makes more, that's more intuitive. That looks it's more really product. counterintuitive to think you can get experiential things from non-experiential things. Yeah, you might think... Um, the physicalist project, according to Galen Strassen, is something like alchemy. You know, we're trying to get gold from base metals or something. You know, we're start, trying to start with lead and turn it into gold. And that's just never going to happen. Um, the physicalist is trying to start with things that are non-experiential and say, like, well, if they interact in the right sort of way, um, if they're arranged in the right sort of way, then boom, out pops this totally new kind of thing, conscious experience. Um, so the dualist and the panpsychist sort of agree, epic handshake, that doesn't look very promising. Um, but the, they go different directions after that. And the panpsychist says, well, maybe it would help if we said the little itty bitty things that are doing the composing are themselves conscious. Um, but I think the dualist is going to say, that's, I, don't, I don't think that's going to help. <laughs> mm -hmm. But here's something else Galen Strassen said. He said, um, emergence can't be brute or unexplained. For any feature Y of anything that's correctly considered to be emergent from X, there must be something about X and X alone in virtue of which Y emerges, which is sufficient for Y. So um, less abstractly, what he's saying is, um, if you think that the mental emerges from the physical, so the mental is Y and the physical is X, there must be something about the physical and the physical alone um, that explains Y the mental is emerging. Um, and so he thinks, oh, we've got to change our conception of what it is to be physical then. And we've got to have some mental stuff down there. We've got to have some, we've got to make the elementary particles conscious. <laughs> and then we'll be able to see how, when you get these little conscious components together, you might be able to get um, an emergent mind, an emergent conscious experience. That's the view. Um, and I thought the argument is just something like this, just in a very basic form. It's something like there's no way to reduce the mental to merely physical stuff, non-experiential physical stuff. But of course, um, it looks like he's assuming, well, obviously dualism is false. <laughs> you can't just say the mental is irreducibly non-physical. Um, somehow a reduction needs to happen. Um, and if we can't reduce the mental to merely physical stuff, then what seems to follow is physical stuff isn't merely physical. It's, it's experiential. It's also mental. Okay, so that seems to be his argument there. But of course, if you're a dualist like me, you're going to say, <laughs> I disagree with premise two. I don't see why this sort of reduction needs to happen. Um, but yeah, I guess if you were committed to the reductive project and you thought that physicalism was hopeless, panpsychism offers you another alternative. Okay, so that's one argument for panpsychism. But again, I don't think a dualist is going to find premise two at all um, plausible. Here's uh, one from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy summarizing an argument from Philip Goff. And the idea is that there's a clear simplicity argument in favor of panpsychism. In the absence of any reason to suppose otherwise, 
the most simple, elegant, parsimonious hypothesis is that the matter outside of brains is continuous with the matter of brains and also having a consciousness involving nature. So if you think that um, there's something about the matter within brains that allows for consciousness, there's something about the nature of the matter in brains that's consciousness involving, why wouldn't you say the same thing for the matter outside of brains too? Wouldn't that lead to a view of nature that's more uniform and continuous and simple? Um, so yeah, that's the idea. Um, if you think that the matter of brains, the matter that composes our brains, has a consciousness involving nature, there's something special about it that allows for the emergence of consciousness. Why wouldn't you say that, oh, the same thing goes for all matter everywhere. All matter has this sort of consciousness involving nature. Okay, so I just um, omitted that from the conclusion here, but what's gonna follow is the simplest hypothesis is that matter outside of brains also has a consciousness involving nature. Mm -hmm. Okay, but again, um, I think a dualist is gonna say, why think that the actual matter of brains has a consciousness involving nature? Um, why think that it's part of the nature of the matter that it's conscious or something like that in brains? Um, the dualist is gonna say, the matter that composes our brains is not experiential at all. Um, there are just these sort of laws that connect the physical world to our psychology, um, such that when matter gets in a certain arrangement, it causes or it leads to um, a certain kind of conscious experience in a mind. But the matter itself is not consciousness involving. Yeah, so um, there too, I didn't think that argument was very convincing, but I think the best argument is uh, this one. This is the argument that I typically hear from panpsychists. Um, they say, look, here's why you should be a panpsychist. It has all the benefits and none of the costs of both dualism and physicalism. So it's gonna kind of, it's, it's the best of both worlds. You get the best of dualism and the best of physicalism and um, the worst of neither. So for example, they'll say things like, uh, well, panpsychism is going to avoid or solve the causal exclusion argument that besets dualism. That's a real problem for dualism. Um, and it's going to solve or avoid the knowledge argument that challenges physicalism. So if you think like, oh, here's the very best argument against dualism, the best argument for a kind of reductive physicalism, it's the causal exclusion argument. If panpsychism avoids that or solves that, oh, cool, that, then it avoids the main problem of dualism. And if you think, um, something about the explanatory gap or the knowledge argument, the hard problem of consciousness, if you think that's the best reason to be a dualist, um, but that doesn't disprove panpsychism, and in fact, it's sort of consistent with panpsychism, then again, panpsychism avoids the main challenge to physicalism. So um, let me show you why they think this. Here's a statement of the causal exclusion argument. So um, physicalists ask you to imagine, they're trying to convince you that your mental states are identical to some physical state of your brain. So um, in the case of pain, like when I'm feeling pain, let's just call the neural correlate of pain C fibers firing, whatever it is. Whatever the neural correlate of pain is, we'll just call it C fibers firing. Okay, so this is supposed to be an argument to convince you that pain just is C fibers firing. They're one and the same thing. Okay, so why think that? Well, imagine a case where you're feeling pain, so you take an aspirin, so your body exhibits this sort of aspirin-taking behavior. <laughs> we can ask, why is your body doing this? Well, we surely want to say that um, pain figures into the explanation. You're taking the aspirin because of the pain. So pain plays a causal role in producing this behavior. Okay, so that's what premise one says. Mm -hmm. My pain causes me to take an aspirin, or at least it's part of the cause. It figures into the cause. My mental states, my mental properties are making a causal difference. Um, okay, but premise two says science has disclosed to us that every physical event has a sufficient physical cause. Pick any physical event you want. There will be some prior um, physical event that was sufficient to bring about the first physical event, the effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's just another way of saying um, physics is um, complete. Uh, so pick any physical event you want, there's gonna be a prior sufficient physical cause. 
Okay, um, it follows from two that on this particular occasion, this sort of physical event, my aspirin taking behavior um, is going to have a physical cause. And so let's say it's, you know, that C fiber spring. There's some event in my brain that sent a signal down my spine to my arms, which caused, you know, the muscles to contract and the aspirin to go in the mouth and so on. There's going to be a physical story about why I took this aspirin. Okay, now here's the worry. Um, we have now have sort of too many causes. I've got the purely physical story about why I took the aspirin. And I've got this mental story about why I took the aspirin. Mm -hmm. So we've got these competing causes. Um, it was the pain that caused me to take the aspirin. And it was also this physical story involving the C fibers firing that caused me to take the aspirin. And so premise four says, it's unreasonable to believe that Cases like this always involve overdetermination. Why think that? Well, it's sort of inelegant, I guess. That's one reason. That's just an aesthetic reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but here's maybe something more like a reason. Um, why would evolution have allowed for this? It's, it's superfluous. It's too much. Um, wouldn't it have been simpler and more efficient for creatures to just ditch the mental stuff and just have the physical stuff, right? Like, why do we have these two causes? Um, yeah, it's superfluous. And it would have been selected against for the sake of efficiency or something like that. Um, yeah, you might think that's why we don't have more than five fingers or something. Five's enough. Five does mm -hmm. the job. Four is not as good. Six is unnecessary. So we settled on five or something like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, why would we have these two causes? One would have been enough. Why do we have two? So that's why I think people say cases like these never involve overdetermination. And by overdetermination, I mean two sufficient causes. Okay, so if you think that's right, then here's a way to solve the problem. Just say, okay, I don't have two causes. Uh, the pain just is the C fibers firing. And then look, I solved the problem. <laughs> now there's no competition between causes. Okay, um, so that's the causal exclusion argument. And if you're into constitutive panpsychism, you're giving an answer kind of like that. If you're into constitutive panpsychism, if you think that my pain is grounded in, constituted by, realized by, or I think you actually have to say to avoid the causal exclusion argument, you have to say it's identical to the goings on in these electrified elementary particles in these conscious elementary particles. If you say my pain is reducible to the um, conscious physical particles, then yeah, you avoid the causal exclusion argument. So it does look like constitutive panpsychism is going to avoid it, at least if they're willing to make the identity claim. If they say, no, it's constitution, but not identity. My pain is constituted by the conscious elementary particles, but not identical to them. Then we've mm -hmm. still got too many causes. We need it to be identity. We need there to just be one thing there. Okay. So if you're a constitutive panpsychist of that variety, it does look like you avoid a causal exclusion argument. Um, All right, gonna... so that was one benefit yeah. for panpsychism, specifically constitutive panpsychism. But you said there was another benefit, and that is that they avoid the knowledge, or they have a way of solving the knowledge argument? Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to kind of list the benefits first, and then we'll get to the costs. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> I jumped ahead. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's another benefit. Um, hopefully your listeners are familiar with the knowledge argument. I'm, I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, but we imagine a brilliant neuroscientist who's sort of locked in a black and white room and given information about human color vision via black and white monitors and black and white books. So this person has never seen color before, has just seen black and white information. But it looks like we could convey to this person all the physical facts about human color vision um, in her black and white room, we'll call this person Mary. Um, we can convey all the physical facts about human color vision to this person. We can tell Mary about, um, you know, how wavelengths are reflected off surfaces, what they do on your retina, what happens to your optic nerve, what goes on in your visual cortex. We can give Mary the whole physical story about human color vision in this black and white room. And premise one says, well, look, if physicalism is true and we give Mary all the physical facts about human color vision, then she has all the facts about physical, about human color vision because physicalism says all the facts are physical facts. 
So if we give her all the physical facts, she has all the facts. Okay, so if physicalism is true, it looks like she could have all the facts. She could know all the facts about human color vision, even in her black and white room. But the problem is now imagine she leaves her room and sees a red apple for the first time. And surely this would be a really momentous discovery for her. Um, there's videos on YouTube of people who put on those special glasses that correct color blindness and they see color for the first time. And you can see in their faces, this is a really profound discovery for them. And they often just weep um, because it's so beautiful. Um, so something like that would happen to Mary. She'd be very struck and she might even say things like, Oh, that's what it's like to see red. I always wondered what it was like to see red. And now I know what it's like to see red. <clears throat> so that's what premise two says. She would learn something new when she leaves her black and white room and actually experiences color for the first time. But it seems to follow from two that if she learned something new, then she didn't really know all the facts about human color vision. Because here's one of the facts about human color vision. Um, there's some fact about what it's like to experience red. And she didn't know that. Um, all right, but then one and three together give you the conclusion that oh, physicalism must be false. Okay, so that's the knowledge argument. Um, here's what Philip Goff says in response. Here's how panpsychism is supposed to help. He says, um, so that's the challenge to physicalism. If you were to consider an analogous challenge to the constitutive um, panpsychist, then we have to imagine that Mary knows not only the physical facts, um, but also the facts about the micro experience um, that the constitutive panpsychist takes to underlie human experience of red. It is much less clear that Mary would not be able to work out what it's like to see red from this basis. Okay, um, so now I'm just wondering, like, how does one spell constitutive? Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is a quote from Goff. Um, so maybe I'm just spelling it wrong this whole time. And if so, my bad. Um, but I would have thought it was constitutive. Anyway, um, just bear with me with the spelling of that. But here's the idea. So the physicalist says uh, all the facts are physical facts. Um, and it looks like mm, the physicalist says all the facts are physical facts. So it looks like Mary could know all those in her black and white room. So couldn't she know all the facts about human color vision? Could we run a similar argument against um, constitutive panpsychism? We give Mary all the facts about um, electrified elementary particles, conscious elementary particles. She knows all about them. She knows all the facts. Would she be able to work out in her black and white room what it's like to see red if she were given those facts? And what Philip Goff says is it is less clear that Mary would not be able to work out what it's like to see red from this basis. So she really knew all the facts about um, conscious elementary particles and you know how they compose brains and so on. Um, Philip Goff thinks, ah, maybe she would be in a position to know what it's like to see red then. Um, so that's, and of course, if you're a um, emergent panpsychist, you're gonna say, no, the knowledge argument's fine. Um, the problem is she would only know about the um, fundamental facts uh, the elementary particle facts about conscious experience, but that wouldn't put her in a position to know about um, further facts about emergent minds, emergent conscious experience. So the emergent panpsychist is okay with the knowledge argument. Um, the problem would only arise for a constitutive panpsychist. And what Philip Goff says is maybe if you knew enough about the conscious elementary particles, you, Mary would be in a position to know what it's like to see red. Okay, so now let's turn to problems for panpsychism. Um, yeah, so summing up at this point, yeah. it looked like you gave three arguments for panpsychism. Two of them, the dualist is going to be like, this isn't very convincing. That last one, um, w would you say it's like still on the table at this point? Um, the last one was it helps with... Um, Panpsychism solving those has, problems. Yeah, has the benefits of dualism and physicalism and none of the costs. Yeah, yeah, so far I've just tried to tell you what the alleged benefits are supposed to be. Okay. Um, but now we're going to look at the costs. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so here are some problems for panpsychism. One is uh, let's return to the causal exclusion argument really quickly. So there was the argument 
So um, it may be that if you're a constitutive panpsychist and you say, look, my pain is somehow reducible to the goings on in the conscious elementary particles, then yeah, you do avoid the causal exclusion argument. But if you're an emergent panpsychist, um, then you don't avoid the problem. You've still got too many causes. Does that make sense? Because the emergent panpsychist says, yeah, you've got the little elementary particles that compose your brain and they themselves have forms of conscious experience. But your conscious experience is not reducible to the goings on in these elementary particles. So it's, it's, it's looks, remember it has a structure of dualism, emergent yeah. panpsychism does. So um, it's not gonna avoid the causal exclusion argument we're still going to have to find some other answer, whatever answer the dualist can give, the emergent panpsychist can give, but emergent panpsychism doesn't offer you any advantage here in the face of the causal exclusion argument. Um, so we have to distinguish between the two kinds of panpsychism. One is kind of like physicalism. It has a structure of physicalism. We're reducing your mind to the goings on and elementary particles. The other kind of panpsychism has a structure of dualism. There is no such reduction. It's emergent. Your conscious experiences are irreducibly non-elementary particle-ish. <laughs> so it has a structure of dualism. Okay, so we already knew that the causal exclusion argument was kind of a problem for dualism. Yeah. It's also a problem for emergent panpsychism. We already knew that the causal exclusion argument wasn't really a problem for physicalism. No surprise that it's not a problem for a constitutive panpsychism that has the same structure of physicalism. So what I'm saying is there's sort of no surprises here. The version of panpsychism that's like dualism has the same problems as dualism. The version of panpsychism that's like physicalism um, doesn't have a problem here, but neither does physicalism. So, so far, there's no real advantage. And if you think about the knowledge argument, you'll see the, the same thing kind of happens here. Um, so... Remember, Philip Goff says, if Mary knew enough about the conscious lives of elementary particles, um, then maybe she'd be in a position to know what it's like to see red. So here's my response. Um, I wonder, so he says, if she knew the facts about the micro experience of the constitutive particles, the, the micro experiences that underlie human experience of red, if she knew that, maybe she'd be able to work out what it's like to see red from this basis. So my first question is just what are these facts? Because panpsychists are typically pretty um, mum when it comes to the question of what is the conscious experience like of an electron? We just hear things like it's incredibly basic or something like that. Okay, um, but I mean, what is it exactly? Are these things, are electrons like having experiences of red? Um, or is it more basic than that somehow? We're not really told. But if we're not really told what these micro experiences are that Mary's getting knowledge of, it's hard to evaluate the claim that maybe she could work out what it's like to experience red. Okay, so that's, that's just the first point. Like, I, I don't think we're in a position to know whether on the panpsychist view, Mary would be in a position to work out what it's like to see red because we don't really know what the panpsychist is saying about these elementary particles. Okay, but second of all, how would it be, how would it work that knowing about the mental lives of particles, you know, from the outside, you tell me, oh, that electron is experiencing red and that one is experiencing the taste of banana. And um, this boson over here is experiencing the smell of onion or something like that. So you tell, you tell Mary all of that. So she knows about the mental lives of these particles from the outside. Um, especially if none of them is actually experiencing red, we still don't know whether these elementary particles are having experiences like that, whether they're having experiences of red or if it's more basic somehow. Um, but even if it ex included the experience of red, even if some of these elementary particles are experiencing red, how is that going to help Mary work out what it's like for her to experience red from the inside? And here's a way you can see that, like she could already know in her black and white room all about our mental lives, my mental life and your mental life. She could know all about that um, from the outside. She'd have facts like right now, uh, suppose you're looking at a fire hydrant. Right now, Jordan's having an experience of red and I'm looking at the sky. She could know right now, um, Thomas is having an experience of blue. She could know all that. But none of that puts her in a position to know what it would be like for her, what it's actually like to see red, to experience red. 
Or just um, consider, you know, those colorblind people again. They know that people are experiencing, um, let's say it's a red-green kind of colorblindness. So they just see red and green as kind of this rusty brown or whatever it is. They know that some people see red and some people see green on different occasions. They know all that. But prior to putting on those glasses that corrects the colorblindness, they don't know what it's like to see red. They don't know what it's like to see green. So wouldn't Mary be in that sort of position? She was already in that position when it comes to our conscious experiences. How will it help to tell her that these elementary particles are having conscious experiences? How will that help? Yeah, so just last way to put it. Um, she already knows all the facts about micro reality that the physicalist takes to underline experience of red. That doesn't help her figure out what it's like to see red. How will it help to electrify these, ele these elementary particles, so to speak? How will it help to say, oh, in addition, um, by the way, Mary, uh, these elementary particles are themselves conscious. I mean, how is that going to help her figure out what it's like to see red? Yeah, so let me just try to put it one last way. She knows all the facts about your brain down to the finest detail. She knows all the component elementary particles that are making up your brain, how they're interacting. She knows all that. It seems like that is not enough. And she knows all about the mass and the charge and the spin. She knows all that. And that's not enough to put her in a position to know what it's like to see red. How does it help to say, oh, by the way, these fundamental physical properties are themselves forms of conscious experience? It's not like a light's going to go off and she's going to go and she's going to realize, oh, OK, well, now I know what it's like to see red. <laughs> I don't think that's going to help. I mean, she's still going to have to actually have the experience, you know? Okay, so I don't think that um, panpsychism is going to help avoid the knowledge problem or solve the knowledge the knowledge argument, um, and so this argument is meant to target physicalism. The analogous version would be targeting the version of panpsychism that is structurally like physicalism, that's constitutive panpsychism. So I don't see how constitutive panpsychism is going to avoid the knowledge argument or how it helps us solve the knowledge argument. Okay, so again, just summing up. Oh, I think I have a little slide here that sums up. Yeah, so constitutive panpsychism is like physicalism, has the structure of physicalism. We're trying to reduce our mental experiences, our mental lives, to the goings-on in elementary particles. Emergent panpsychism is like dualism. It has a structure of dualism. Okay, but I don't see how we've gotten any advantage here. Constitutive panpsychism has no problem with the causal exclusion argument. Maybe if they're willing to make the identity claim, um, but neither did um, physicalism. Constitutive panpsychism looks like it has a big problem with the knowledge argument, and so does physicalism. So it has the same costs as physicalism, the same benefits as physicalism. Um, we haven't gotten any advantage here. Emergent panpsychism similarly has no problem with the knowledge argument, but neither does dualism, so no advantage there. And it looks like it has a big problem with the causal exclusion argument, but so does dualism, right? So no advantage there. So I don't see how it has helped to electrify the elementary particles, as it were. We still have trouble seeing how um, the mental reduces to the physical. That's okay. Yeah, that slide was really helpful. That was, that was a great summary. Okay, great. Um, so I just had a few more things to say. Oh boy, it's been over half an hour, my bad. Um, here I think is the biggest problem. Um, so it would be one thing if um, panpsychism didn't help, but it didn't hurt. And then you're just like, well, it's neutral and I sort of like it, so <laughs> I'll accept it. Um, but if panpsychism brings along problems of its own, um, then it looks like there's really no good reason to accept it. So I think this is the problem with um, panpsychism. And I think this is really helps understand the mind-body problem generally. Here is, I think, the intuition that underlies uh, the mind-body problem. And this is from um, a couple of papers written by a philosopher, David Barnett, um, who was at Boulder for a while, but uh, since then has retired from philosophy. And he actually invented pop sockets, those things that go on the back of your phone. Oh, wow. Um, so, yeah, he's doing just fine now. <laughs> um, but back when he was doing philosophy, he wrote a paper about um, the simplicity intuition and its hidden influence on the philosophy of mind. And I highly recommend it. Um, this is the simplicity intuition. 
He says, um, our naive conception of a conscious being demands that conscious beings be simple. That is that they don't have parts. When we attribute um, mental states to things, we want to attribute it to unified things, things that we conceive of as simple. Um, so they, they, that seems to be the only way they could be um, bearers of mental properties if it's just one thing there. Because we think of minds as one thing. Um, if, if a mind is experiencing feeling pain or if a mind is um, experiencing red, there's one thing that's feeling pain and there's one thing that's experiencing red. So minds are kind of unified or simple in that way. And he thinks this explains all sorts of um, thought experiments in philosophy and why we find them so plausible. So Descartes had a version of a zombie, imagines a kind of mechanical device that's very much like a body. Um, but when you think of it, you think of it in terms of all the parts and we're not very inclined to attribute mentality to something like that. Um, or if you just think about the explanatory gap, we think about all the physical facts, we think about mental um, facts, and we wonder how could the, the mental facts just be reducible to or explicable in terms of the goings on and all these, this sort of swirl of physical particles, how could that be? We kind of want there to be one thing to be the bearer of these mental properties. Um, Hilary Putnam imagines a swarm of bees and being told like, that swarm is very angry. <laughs> like no individual bee is angry, but the swarm has a mind or something like that. Um, well, if you think of the swarm uh, with, in terms of the bees that are all kind of spread out and there's distances between them, we're not very inclined to attribute mental states to something like that when we can see that it's not simple and it's composed of bits. Because you're kind of wondering like, where is the thing that is angry? You know, there's no one thing that's angry. Um, if you zoom out and you can't see the individual bees, then we're kind of more inclined to attribute mental states to it. And maybe that's what's going on with our physical bodies. You know, like when I look at you and you look at me, and I think David Hume said something like this, we are inclined to deceive ourselves into thinking of each other as unified single things. But if you zoomed in <laughs> and looked at, you know, realizing physical objects are like mostly empty space, we're told, um, if you could see a human body for what it really is, this sort of spread out constellation of particles, then suddenly we become much less inclined to attribute mentality to it. Okay, just a couple other ones. Um, Ned Block imagines that we have a robot body that's functioning just like you. So when I ask, is your name Jordan? The robot body says, yes, of course. Um, when I offer it, you know, an apple, it says, thank you. Um, but What's controlling this robot body is just a bunch of little conscious people in the skull of the robot. Um, and they're, you know, pulling on levers and pushing buttons to make sure that the robot body behaves just like your body. Um, people are not very inclined to say, in addition to all the minds of the little people running the show, there's an additional mind um, of this robot body. And again, the simplicity intuition explains that. Okay, um, so I'll stop there, but you can kind of see how it would go with the, the other sorts of examples there. Yeah, yeah, I like that little robot example. Great. So um, I included this little Cogsworth fellow here because um, when we watch like Disney movies like Beauty and the Beast and the, the movie is, you know, representing that we've got a physical object here that's conscious. Our minds have kind of no problem with that. We're like, sure, conscious brooms, conscious clocks, conscious candlesticks, that's all fine. Um, but only to the degree that we see them as like unified things. We see like, oh, that's one thing there. I can attribute mentality to it. Um, but if you understand physicalism for what it is, it's the claim that, well, really the subject of conscious experience is this constellation of elementary particles. Um, and if you zoom in, you can see, you know, see it for what it is as this constellation of spread out, discontinuous um, particles, then we're much less inclined to attribute mentality to the thing. Because again, it's like, where is the thing to which I'm attributing the mental states? Where is the thing that's in pain? Um, yeah, because that's, I mean, that's what a physicalist says. Like when a physicalist says pain is C fibers firing um, or you know, you are your brain. So when you feel pain, it's the brain that's feeling pain. 
-hmm. If you zoom in on the brain and realize like, well, the brain is just composed of all these little neurons, all these little bits. No individual bit is itself feeling pain, but we're told, oh, it's actually, you know, the, the compound thing here, um, the composite that's feeling pain. Well, the trouble that some people have and what might be animating this whole mind body problem is point to the composite, you know, <laughs> like point to it. Um, it's not that neuron. It's not, it's not that neuron. Um, you can't just like gesture to all of them um, because there's no one thing there. It's just many things. Okay. So that's the simplicity intuition. And I think that kind of explains why physicalism has had a hard go of it as a view in the philosophy of mind, but panpsychism doesn't help avoid that problem. We still run up against the simplicity intuition, even if we make the component bits conscious, that doesn't mm -hmm. help. It's just like what Ned Block did with that, you know, a brain composed of conscious people You're pushing right. the right buttons and pulling the right levers. Um, yeah, so we, we sort of resist saying that, oh, yes, that robot is conscious because we realize, oh, it's just little individual bits that are running the show in there, little conscious persons. And it doesn't help to be told that the people themselves are conscious. That doesn't help us see out how, how like, oh, yeah, I guess the robot could be conscious. It doesn't help. Um, so, yeah, the point is just the, the problem for physicalism was this simplicity intuition. Panpsychism doesn't help. Um, so I think that's the main problem for panpsychism. And as for the causal exclusion argument, um, it's a problem for emergent panpsychism. It looks like it's a problem for dualism, but it's not an insurmountable problem. Dualism has some moves that it can make or some answers that it can give. And emergent panpsychism could do the same thing, but again, it's not as though emergent panpsychism has an advantage here. So you could challenge premise two. Um, and I think probably that's what a dualist is gonna have to do. You could say, Look, somehow immaterial minds are going to be interacting with the causal order. And so there will be some things that happen that would not have happened but for the interaction of this mind. So somehow there will be some events, some physical events that don't have a um, sufficient physical cause um, because a mind came in and made a difference. So um, I think that probably a dualist ideally would want to, to deny premise two. And in fact, when discussing emergent panpsychism, Philip Goff also um, casts doubt on premise two as well. He says, do we really have observational grounds for holding that everything that takes place in the cerebral cortex is entirely determined by the causal powers of its micro level constituents? Um, and it turns out if you look into it, the case for um, premise two is pretty weak. So I'll just say like, that's a place where a dualist could challenge the argument, an emergent panpsychist could as well, but it's not like the panpsychism part of emergent panpsychism is helping. It doesn't mm -hmm. help that the elementary particles are themselves conscious. Okay, or you could just make your peace with overdetermination and say, hey, yeah, I guess, you know, um, it's a little superfluous here. We do have two sufficient causes. Sometimes overdetermination happens. You know, maybe sometimes uh, philosophers often use really violent examples involving death. <laughs> and that's the only one that's coming to mind right now. But it could be that someone dies for two sufficient reasons, you know, like lightning strike and bullet to the chest at the same time. The lightning would have been enough to kill the person. The bullet would have been enough to kill the person. Both happened at the same time. Um, so there might be more than one sufficient cause there. So some we know that sometimes overdetermination happens. If you wanted to deny premise four, you would just have to make your peace with this happening pretty regularly. Um, but those are two ways that you can resist the causal exclusion argument. Okay, yeah. So then that last question I was gonna ask was, I guess they're somewhat related. It's kind of two questions in one, which is, can a theist be a panpsychist? And in addition to that, does theism do a better job of explaining uh, consciousness than panpsychism. Yeah. Um, so I had a few thoughts about that and this will be pretty brief. So the question was, is panpsychism compatible with theism? Um, so my thought was, I guess so. Yeah, they're compatible. Um, so long as panpsychism is coherent, um, supposing it really is coherent. And um, once we actually understand what's being said, if we concede that that's possible, 
then I would think God could exist and panpsychism could be true. But um, I myself can't see why God would do things that way. Um, it's not necessary to electrify particles, as it were, to make them conscious in order to get minds like ours. That's not necessary. And it looks like adding experience down there at the bottom level, at the elementary particle level, doesn't help get conscious minds at the higher level. So why would God do it? It's just sort of an extra extra thing that doesn't help and it's not necessary. Um, so I'm not sure why God would do it. Um, so I don't think you have, as a theist, I don't think you have like positive reasons to think that God would do this. Um, but I guess he could if he wanted to. <laughs> he could make the elementary particles conscious. Um, yeah, I think if God wanted to, he could associate a conscious mind with, you know, inanimate objects, like, you know, water bottles and so on. He could if he wanted to. But I don't see why he would. Um, and then you had also asked, um, is theism a better explanation of consciousness than panpsychism? Um, and here are some thoughts I had in reply. Well, I think theism can explain why there are conscious minds at all and why the psychophysical laws are finely tuned. Um, you can appeal to God and his intentions, um, the sort of things he wanted in order to explain this. Um, constitutive panpsychism, so I have been misspelling that this whole time, and that's my bad. I figured that out. Um, constitutive panpsychism struggles to explain our minds in terms of lower level facts. Um, so at least there, if you're going to be that kind of panpsychist, there will be something that you struggle to explain. Um, how is it that the um, you know conscious elementary particles are somehow grounding or realizing or constituting higher level conscious experiences? So some, you'll have trouble explaining that, whereas it looks like theism and dualism doesn't really have trouble explaining that. And emergent panpsychism is going to have the same sort of finely tuned psychophysical laws um, that dualism has, because we're going to have these little conscious elementary particles causing there to be minds like yours and mine. And so there's going to be laws connecting the two. But um, I say, if you just accept emergent panpsychism, that doesn't automatically give you an explanation of why these psychophysical laws are finely tuned. It would give you a reason to believe in God because that would help you explain why these psychophysical laws are finely tuned. But the panpsychism part doesn't help explain that. Um, so no, I guess I don't think panpsychism is a better explanation of consciousness than theism. Um, yeah, and then I just ended with this little meme. I wish all your constituent particles a very pleasant evening. <laughs> That's a funny meme. Yeah. Did you make that? I did. Yeah. Um, supposing that you have constituent particles that are conscious, I wish them a pleasant uh, evening. You're clever. All right, thanks, man. All right, well, we'll stop it there. Thank you so much, Dr. Bogardis. This was super, like, I learned so much just listening to this. Thank you very much. All right, you're welcome. All right, go check out those videos with Dr. Bogardis that I mentioned. We've got two others, one on the mind-body problem, different views, and then another one arguing from consciousness to theism. So go check those out now. Thanks for watching.